I told some of you this morning in my Bible class because I had on this suit that I never wear. And uh, David wasn't here. And I was making fun of myself earlier about it. And Malvin said, hey, man, when I, when I came in and I saw you in that suit, I thought, oh, we got it mixed up. I'm preaching tonight. And Brian must be preaching this morning. So uh, I've dressed down for this occasion because evidently at, at Highland, uh, it's okay if you don't wear the suit. And so uh, someone asked me earlier where my suit was, and I said it's in the trash. So just, uh, I don't know, I did get a lot of compliments on it. It's just one of those suits. You ever just have clothes that are nice, and you just, they just don't fit you right? You know, you just don't, you just don't like it. So I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear this suit today, and that was it. So that was my, that was my mini crisis there this morning. So that's, uh, that's it. All right, well, hey, let's, uh, let's open our Bibles tonight. They're going to be looking at, at a number of passages overall. And, and I don't necessarily have a, a direct scripture reading, but I will tell you the first one we're going to come to is Mark chapter 8, 34 through 38. Now, I did a couple of things this week that I don't normally do. Um, well, one, I don't normally wear that suit, but I'll get off that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I, I don't always, <laughs> oftentimes when David asks me to preach, I don't have a lot of notice uh, some, sometimes with that. And so this week, uh, I got some ideas, I got some thoughts together and it made me made me start thinking about it. so I put some things I've been kicking around in my head on paper uh, this week and so I actually wrote a sermon is where I was going for that imagine that so the uh, the other thing is a, a friend of mine he he recently and I got some of these ideas uh, from some things he had said he had a sermon he was known for uh, his kind of odd sermon titles and he had a sermon called shoot low boys the ride in Shetland ponies you know I mean think about that you know a Shetland ponies only about this big right here you know very small and Obviously, it's about aiming very low with things, and and so um, we we uh, we we've discussed that in the past. He and I have a couple of times, but then then I found this story and it really inspired me on to some further things. This, this lady, this lady right here, <clears throat> this is uh, Flo Miller. She's a world class athlete. I know. Just listen. She lives in Shelburne, Vermont, and at the Indoor World Masters Athletics Championships in Poland. Miller, who was, get this, 84 years old, racked up gold medal after, racked up medal after medal in her age division. She got goals in the high jump, the uh, pentathlon. She also uh, scored uh, medals in the 60-meter hurdles and pole vault. Silvers in long jump and triple jump, and oh, another gold in the 4 by 200 relay. Now, did you notice I said in the pole as if all that's not impressive? but also in pole vaulting. Now, this lady, she took up track and field at, get this, age 60. As she watched the pole vaulting competition at the Senior Olympics, she had the notion, well, they weren't jumping very high, so I, I said to myself, you know, I think I could do better than that. <laughs> so at the sprightly young age of 65, she took up the event. I love challenges, and the pole vault is a challenge. She says you have to have a really strong upper body and upper core and very strong arms. And no problem for her because she was a competitive slalom water skier for 30 years. And that's where you ski on one ski. Uh, very, very hard water ski, period. And yet alone she does it on one ski. So she's competitive that. And she said, I think that's why I've done so well in it because it's the way I've always handled my body. And she's always stayed in good shape. And at one event, she was the only pole, pole vaulter in her age division. I, imagine that. Though there were a few men in the 80 to 84 field. Miller notes that she was by far not the oldest athlete taking part in the meet. She said, quote, there was a lady from India who was 103. She didn't run very fast, but she did it. <laughs> so, always very true, very true. All that winning takes a lot of tra training. She keeps up a rigorous schedule. She says she no longer has time to ski as she devotes herself to five to six days a week to her workouts. On Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays, she'll do track events, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'll do weight machines, and then I'll play doubles tennis, but that's just social tennis. So she mostly trains alone, but has a coach at the University of Vermont, Vermont to help her get ready for competition. Uh, and I have her help me, let's say, with my shot putt. Imagine that. And, and I have her help me doing the high jump and so forth. The competition may be thinning. Imagine that one, too. But Miller doesn't see retirement any soon. Now, I really like this line. She said, you know, if the good Lord gives me my health, I'm going to keep going forever. And I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to being 85, she says, because I'll be at the bottom of the ladder and she'll be in another, t she'll be in another age bracket. 
and I'm going to look at all those records and see what I can do about them. You know, this lady has clearly, clearly set the bar very high for herself in a lot of different ways. And, and, I, and I love the fact that this lady has just, at a time when a lot of people would, you know, naturally be slowing down on a lot of things, this lady is not and refuses to. So I think just kind of in light of this story and the idea of, of setting the bar high for ourselves and other things, I've been thinking about how we set the bar, so to speak, in the church. And I'm convinced, and this isn't in any way, shape, or form necessarily uh, anything against Highland whatsoever. I've, I've been involved in ministry and in, long enough and in enough places and been around enough people to see this trend generally in a lot of places. And I think really that sometimes what we do is we settle for this, the low bar of mediocrity. And, you know, if you set the bar low enough, everybody's exceptional. Well, you know, that really takes away from being exceptional, does it not? Uh, I'm convinced that uh, we can do so much more and are really able to do great things, but we set the bar too low and end up settling for mediocrity. And I think really that the idea is simply this, is that we have to remember at the heart of this who it is that we serve. We serve a really big God. And I, for one, am preaching myself in all this, too, because I, I forget that sometimes. I'm thinking of passages in the Old Testament and names of great prophets like Micah, which means who is like Jehovah. I mean, think about that. And I think about some other prophets and peoples whose names mean like God saves or Yahweh saves and things like that. Just that statement of faith, just in and other names. And it's interesting, a lot of times those people will have messages, those, those prophets have messages that really speak to that idea. Uh, who is like Jehovah, who is whatever it is their name means, uh, they, they speak to that so much. And I think that, of course, we, we believe that, but we, it's, it's really unfathomable how big God is and what God can and what God will do. And I think there's more possible than what we think at times. And so I really want to challenge some of the low bars that we just so happen to set and accept sometimes in the church. And I really want us to... Uh, to compare them in the end with some biblical expectations instead, and then just kind of go on a little bit from there. So let me show you some of the bars we said. I think one of the bars we said is this, is this idea of faithfulness. Now, here's what I mean. Now, again, I don't, I don't think that faithfulness is something we take lying down or anything like that or, or to dismiss. But notice this for just a minute. How is it that, um, or, or why is it rather, that when we ask if someone is a faithful brother or sister in Christ, What's the measure we usually use? Some of you are already grinning. Well, go ahead and say it. What, what's our usual standard? What's the bar we set for that? Are they faithful? What, what's, the, what's the common terminology? What do we say? That's exactly right. Yeah, I'd be embarrassed. We should be embarrassed. Said, do they come to church? Well, I think that's a beginning point, clearly. Are they there? And are there three times a week? I believe that's usually a pretty good start on some level. But isn't it funny how we can, man, they are faithful every time. Man, they're there every time the doors are open. I think we think this, that church attendance equals faithfulness. I think that it's, it, it's part of it. I think that it's a good sign, obviously, but it's clearly not. Because let me challenge you with this. Can I come to church often and still not please God? Oh, absolutely. Now, I know that there are people who attend here, I'm sure. I can't think of anybody off the bat, I'm sure. But I'm sure there are people who attend here that aren't Christians. I know some people in another congregation, one person in particular comes to mind, and this individual was there all the time, Sunday morning, Sunday night, most Wednesday nights they were there. But here's the deal, this person had gone to church their whole life and never obeyed the gospel. Was he a faithful Christian? Well, absolutely not, because he's not even a Christian to begin with. So by our own standard, if we thought about just church, do they come to church three times a week? By our own standard, some way, we've kind of dismissed the entire New Testament church, have we not? How many times do the New Testament church get together? One time, Sunday mornings. Most or sometime during the, during the day of Sunday, they got together. Do you realize that, that Sunday afternoons or Sunday evening, the PM service started within probably like the last 70 to 100 years because of shift work, because people were working during the day and uh, things like that? But notice this, notice, and here's the challenge I want us to look at this. Notice the way Jesus talked about this, and he talked about faithfulness. Jesus said things like, come follow me. Look what Jesus said in, John, in Mark 8 for just a minute. He said this, if anyone wishes to come up after me, he needs to deny himself 
and get up off the couch and come to church even when he doesn't want to. Well, that's not what he said. He said, instead, you take up your cross and you follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. He goes on to say, for of course, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes uh, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And then you look in John chapter 13. We overlook this one also, but notice 13, 34, and 35. Jesus said this, A new commandment I give to you, that you come to church three times a week. No, he says, again, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, by this standard here, by this bar, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So the second one I want to talk about here tonight is this, is not just the idea of faithfulness, okay, with that, but what about this one? What about the idea of right answers? Now, let me just go ahead and say this. I like to be right. Go ahead, say it, Amanda. Amen. I figured I'd get at least one amen tonight from my wife. Now, but don't we all like to be right? Just admit it. It's okay. No shame in that. We all like to be right. Okay, but, but here's the deal. Now, now think about this. And this, this is, this is uh, have you ever seen this? Snooty one-liners that, that are more about having the right answers and the attitude of I'm just trying to prove this is right and everybody else is wrong. And what I'm talking about is when we just try to like pin people down with, with, with one verse or, well, the Bible says right here and this is it, you know, just as if there's not more to it than that, you know. And, and looking, looking at a bigger, fuller biblical context, this is why we do that. This is the overall, this is the overall picture of these things. We have things we hang on which are important in and of themselves, uh, baptism, things like that. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about Ephesians 5.19, that we are to sing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our heart. You know, there's no mi- musical instrument that's, that's mentioned there. We, we hang our hats on that and talk about that proving the idea of, of, of not of, uh, just a cappella singing, and I believe that's a part of it, but there's, there's more to the argument, so to speak. But what if we moved away from that, uh, of just having little quick answers? Because the truth is that requires very little of us, just acceptance of some positions. The Baptists, the Methodists, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witness, the Muslims, they have these things too. If you don't believe me, let the next time the Jehovah's Witness come to your door, ask them what they believe in, man, they will have a quick back at you, one-liner about something, I guarantee it. The Mormons will too, and, and other people will at times. But here's the reality I, I'm, I'm convinced of. All right, we're going to go back to the book of Hosea for just a minute, back in the Old Testament here. Uh, here's the reality that it, that requires little of us, but if you can't really talk about it, you don't really understand it or you don't really know it. And what I mean by that, you ever seen anybody? I remember having a, uh, a, a teacher in high school. She was like the science teacher. It was a small school. Great, great woman. Uh, but she did really well with biology because she taught it all the time. She did well with chemistry because she taught it all the time. But she taught physics every other year. And guess what? She was not a very good physics teacher. I wasn't a very good physics student, so I quit real soon. Um, but, but here's the thing, and she kind of admitted this too. She understood it well enough for her to get it, but she didn't understand it well enough for her to, expl- to, to teach others. Nothing wrong with that. Not a... Not a not anything wrong with that at all. But, but think about this. When we look in the Old Testament and we, and we have this idea here about, and I think it fits really well with this, this thought, of if you can't talk about it, you don't understand it or know it. Uh, Hosea was decrying against his people. Notice what he said. Listen to the word of the Lord. God was speaking through Hosea here concerning his people. O sons of Israel, for the Lord has had a case against the inhabitants of the land because there is no faithfulness or kindness, or here's the big one, or knowledge of God in the land. He goes on in verse 6 and said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. The idea is simply, it wasn't that they didn't know facts about God. It wasn't that they didn't understand a few things about God. They didn't really know God. They didn't really have a relationship with God. They just understood some details that required very little of them overall. And as a result of this, God is crying out against them, saying that I, I really, in, in the end, I've rejected you. As you continue looking in Hosea, 
Notice that God goes on to say in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6, or chapter 6 and verse 3, the challenge is here. The response to God's rebuke is this. So here's what we need to do about it. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. In verse 6, God says, For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And you know, if we can go on and, and think about what it is that we really know about Jesus, what can you really tell others about Jesus? What about, what about the hard stuff? What about the big questions? You know, Jesus I find so interesting. And sometimes I find his responses to people just almost comical because of the way, you know, the, it just hits me sometimes. What, what he actually said to these people in response. But, you know, I find Jesus so fascinating because Jesus attracted people, but he did it without compromise. Do you realize that Jesus on a regular basis ate with sinners? Do you realize that? He intentionally associated himself with people like prostitutes and this special class of, of, of demons called tax collectors. And these horrible people. And Jesus on purpose associated himself with these people without any compromise whatsoever. And I think that when we really understand the heart of God and what he wants, that we can do the same thing. The, second, or the third thing is this. It's the stuff we, we don't do. Now, here's what I mean by this. I'm not talking about the stuff that we... Let's go over to Luke 18 for just a minute. I'm not talking about the stuff that we leave undone or the left out kind of things because uh, we all have that kind of stuff. But what I'm saying is this. Um, I remember David talking about a... Um, <clears throat> he, he did a... And this is a second hand. You all heard this, so help me fill in the blanks. He's mentioned one time that he went to a funeral and he did a funeral for this lady. And he was kind of eulogizing this lady. You know, he knew the lady and he was saying some good things about her, of course. And, and then he was sharing this funeral with someone else that really didn't know her. And it was somebody the family had wanted, her to, you know, this person to be involved. And all this guy could basically come up with was things like, well, she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she didn't run around. You know, she was a good woman. And those things were true, but it was like, you know, kind of cringeworthy because there was so much more to this lady and her faith. But think about this thing. Think about this idea. Have you ever had this attitude of, well, I don't do that. Oh, I'm not them. I didn't, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't park, I don't do those kind of things. It's the stuff we don't do. And, and here's the problem why this is a low bar. Notice what Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 13. He, he shows a, a contrast between two people. And he told them this parable to some of those who, notice, trusted themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. There's the whole problem with this idea of what I don't do. You think you're righteous and you end up viewing others with contempt. Two men go to the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. On paper, the Pharisee looks way better than the other guy. And the Pharisee stood and was praying to himself and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Man, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful, be a sinner. And Jesus says that, that, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This one guy goes to the temple, and of course, I think Jesus is telling this story, and he's kind of on the extreme end of it here on purpose to make his point. This guy's basically going, God, you are so lucky to have me on your side. I mean, look, at, here's what I do. God, I, I give a tenth of everything. I'm, I'm honest and upright. I tithe. I, I fast. And I'm not like them, God. You know what the difference between these two people really was? The difference in all of this was the heart. That's what made the biggest difference in all of this. So when we start to step back and we had that trend, that idea rather instead of a trim, but that idea, that mentality at times of, well, I don't do that. Well, what do you do? Do I live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age as God would have me to be? Another thing I want to talk about is this. So we have these things so far. We've got <clears throat> faithfulness, the right answers, just for the sake of having the right answers, the stuff we don't do. But here's another one, the idea of safety. 
Now, I'm a great person to talk about this because if you've known me and my family for any length of time, you know that the Gregories do not have the best record of safety. All right? <laughs> Curtis, go ahead and laugh. Curtis was there last year, and I had borrowed some walkboards from Curtis, and my wife and I had been, mainly me, working on the underside of our, of our, um, our patio, putting a roof on it, putting a ceiling on it, and literally up and down the ladder hundreds of times all week. We're done. Last time on the ladder, Curtis came over to do some finishing touches on it, and you were like, what, four feet from me, Curtis? I had like this much gutter left. I was wiping off the gutter, cleaning off the gutter, and I put the ladder up a little wonky, and man, as I'm coming down that sucker, it slid. And when I did, I hit the rail of the back porch, and I rolled over on the side and hit the post. I ended up breaking a couple of ribs. And man, it hurt. If it hadn't been for old Curtis there, I landed on the retaining wall. It's about this high. And I, you know, I'm just in a daze, just blinded by pain. And Curtis, I feel Curtis grab me and go, I got you. I can take you to the hospital if you need to. And I, I, I couldn't even talk, man. I, I, I do appreciate that. So Curtis let me go in the house, laid me on the couch where I cried for a while. True story. True story. Okay. Now, we don't have the best track record of safety in my house, but we did make it through the summer without it being hurt. Now, yeah, amen. that's a big amen. That's right. But what about in the church sometimes? Let's go to Revelation chapter 3 for this next one here. All right, what about, what about this? What about this mentality of let's be safe? Let's take no chances. Let's just do a little instead of a lot. Now that sounds good. We can do that at times, right? But you know what happens if we, if we don't take chances? If we don't step out and launch out in the deep, as Jesus talked about in Challenge in Luke 5? You know what happens? It can stagnate and kill a church. You believe me? Listen to this. To the church, now this is to the church at Sardis. He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars said, I know your deeds. You have a name that you are alive, but Jesus says you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things which remain, which are about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in my sight. And remember what you have received and heard and kept it, keep it and repent. Therefore, if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief and you will... Not know how or what hour I'll come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not sore their garments. So he goes on with this. But, but notice the whole point is this. That he's talking to a church that is active. They're living. They're doing things. Or so it seems. And you can very easily fall into the trap of playing it safe. We're kind of doing some things. Well, we could be doing a lot more. But you know, let that, that would take a chance. It'd put us out there. It'd be too risky. What if someone doesn't accept it? What if it cost us in some way? But Jesus said that's what killed the church there at Sardis. You realize there was also a group that Jesus was in constant contact with called the Pharisees that started off uh, probably about 200 years before Jesus came, somewhere around in there, as a restoration group during the, uh, the, the Maccabean Revolt that these people had actually this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, what a name, by the way, actually had the gall to come into the sanctuary of God, the temple, and sacrificed a pig. I mean, this is huge. And so, of course, the Jews revolted greatly. And as a result of that, a guy by the name of Judas the Hammer, what a great name too, comes and leads this revolt against this guy, and they, no pun intended, they put the hammer down on this fella and others, and they go back and they cleanse the temple, which is actually where, um, <clears throat> where Hanukkah came from, this whole festival of, of lights and things like that. And, and, and so out of, this, out of this time period came the Pharisees, who were a back-to-the-Bible kind of people, back to the Torah. Well, we've gone so far away, this is where it's got us, so let's go back to what God said originally. I'm all for that. But here's what they did. Because of that let's play it safe mentality, if God said, here's the line, don't pass this line, well, what if we back up a few feet, sorry, Eddie, and we put a line right here instead, and we make the line back here? Well, if this is safe, this is surely safer. Well, you give that a few generations, and you're suddenly so far removed from what God said and what God intended that you put a hedge, a buffer around the Torah and that's part of what Jesus was into with these guys about all the time. 
Matthew chapter 23, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. And that can lead to fear and make us fearful of doing anything new. Fear that we might be leaving God's pattern. Fear that we might be going away from God's word. But see, let's not be like that. We don't have to play it safe when we, when we are remaining faithful to God. And here's another thing, too. The idea of the church building. And what I mean by this is simply, where did the first century church meet? Where was the Jerusalem Church of Christ building? Well, think about it. Where was it? That's right. That's somebody's house is where it was. They didn't take a sign over the door or anything like that. We understand that. But... My point is this, is that when we read the New Testament model, I, I really am convinced, and, and, and I do this too, it's hard not to because of the way our modern culture is, but, but I think we're, we're too building-centric at times, almost as if we can't do anything outside the church building, that if we did something outside the building, if we worshiped outside the building or did something somewhere else, that maybe that didn't count. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't die for you to sit on a pew and cause problems when your feelings are hurt about matters of opinions or church programs. You see, the thing about it is, is that the church is so much more than the building. That's my point out of all of this. And that can lead us, if we're not careful, to thinking and selling Christianity as this, as everything we do here is all that matters. Because it can lead us to think, well, I did it all in worship. My card's punched. I'm good until the next time. And we just kind of leave it all on the pew. I remember one of my teachers in high school, this, well, actually he was assistant principal, uh, Mr. Mayfield. And uh, Mr. Mayfield was, was known to uh, paddle people, which I tried to avoid greatly, so I kept clear of Mr. Mayfield uh, on a regular basis. That's another story. But Mr. Mayfield, though, would tell people, and I, I don't remember ever telling me this, but, but I'd heard him say that he was a Christian on Sundays. <laughs> you know, the rest of the week he was Coach Mayfield. And he was a pretty good guy overall, but I think, you know, Mr. Mayfield, you missed the point, buddy. And I really hope that that wasn't how he viewed things overall. But that's what, he was, that's what I remember, you know, him being, him being uh, known to have said a few times. Okay, so, so if, that's the, if those are some of the low bars that we set, what about the higher bar that we can set? Let's look at how God described this. Look at the way that Paul talked about this in Philippians chapter 3. I've only got part of the verse up there. But look at what Paul said. Paul said he forgets what, what lies behind, and he's straining toward what is ahead, and he presses on toward the goal. And look at, look at what Paul said. Let me, let me read a little bit more of this verse here. Paul talked about it in terms of an upward calling. Not that I've already obtained it or I'm perfect. I'm not there yet, but I'm pressing on so that I can lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I don't regard myself as laying hold of it yet, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind, and I, I'm reaching forward to what lies ahead, and I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Did Paul set the bar low? Did he have low expectations for the church? Absolutely not. I remember one thing that John says in 1 John, he says that God's um, commandments are not burdensome, they're not grievous. It's not that you can't, not that God has set the bar impossibly high. Absolutely not. James 1.22, James says that we are to be doers of the word. Does that sound like the bar is set low for us there to be doers of the word? And look at Jesus. Notice this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the people from chapter 11 of Hebrews, let us throw off every weight that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance of race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy, look at that, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Brethren, aren't we proud that Jesus didn't set the bar low? Aren't we proud that Jesus didn't set the bar low? Amen to that indeed. Does he expect us to do the same? Absolutely not. So what, what, what can we do about it? Let's make it a little more personal here. 
Several things here I think we can do. And you can put these in your pocket and take them home with you. Here's one thing I think we can do. I think that we can listen to people in general without judgment. That I'm not the judge. I may not like what you're doing. I may not always agree with what this is. I may not always like the way it's done in the church or these things. But, you know, I can listen without judgment and jump into conclusions. I can, most of all, develop Christ-likeness in my own life and try to be like Jesus. I can be sincere in who I am. I can be the real thing when it comes to faith. Ever see people, and we call them two-faced at times, but really I, I think there's more to it than that. Ever see people, and I always like these people, that, that are just real, that you see them in one place, and you see, you see them at church, and you see them somewhere else, and they're pretty much the same person. You, ever, you like that? I know some folks like that, and I really appreciate that. I personally try to be a real person. I mean, if you see me anywhere else, I, I'm probably going to act about the same way. So uh, make of that what you will. I don't know if that's necessarily a, a good thing or a bad thing. But, you know, it's just a general goal for me, you know, to be like that. But, but don't you, you know, you ever get tired of people who just aren't the real thing? Or see that in people at times when they're just not the real thing? I saw this quote the other day, and I really like this. What about if we did this? If we stop trying to be the best version of yourself... And start being a better reflection of Jesus. Chapter 3, right here, in Eddie's phone. (laughs) Well, at least it's scripture that's playing, so that's that's okay. That's all right. We're having technical difficulty. (laughs) We we know, Eddie, it's okay. (laughs) All right. Here's a little red, Eddie. That's okay. All right, what, what about this right here? What if, we, what if we stopped trying to be the best version of ourselves and started being a better reflection of Jesus? What about this? And this one's hard. What if we were to pray big? What if we were to give big? What if we were to do more? What if we were to set goals? I've thought about this idea of pray big. I don't even know what that means. It sounds good. But I, 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 don't, I don't know what that means to me necessarily. Does it mean I need to pray more? Does it mean I I need to ask bigger things from God? I I don't know. I'm sure it it looks different to all of us on some level. But but think about that idea. How would you personally answer pray big? What would that look like in your life? What would that look like to you? Maybe it means I need to spend more time in prayer. Maybe it means that I need to be more sincere and, and more focused when I'm praying. Maybe it means I need to have more faith to ask God for the bigger things and the small things, seeing that He cares about everything I do. What about give big? Now, wait, Brian, stop there. I know what that one means. Does it mean that I need to readjust my budget and I need to probably dig a little deeper if I can? Does it mean that I need to look a a few more places and, and give more? Does it mean that maybe I need to set aside a little extra sometimes and then when then... The elders come and say, hey, we're taking up a special collection because we have some brothers and sisters here that have fallen on hard times. Hey, wait a minute, I didn't know that, but hold on a second. I can go home and let me get whatever it is I've set aside for those extra times. What does that look like? What about, what does do more look like? Does it mean that maybe, hey, you know, Brian, I'm willing to help teach class to these young kids. I'm willing to take on a class with the the adults here. Does it look like, Hey, I'm going to set some goals here for myself. I I don't know what exactly it looks like to you, but what can we do? How can we do more? What does that look like to set goals for ourselves? And how how do we do this? Where do we go from this? Here's another thing I think we need to take very seriously overall. Is that I think that we need to reevaluate what we do and why we do it periodically. And, And what I mean by this is except that there are just times when when we need to change things up, when we need to do something different. You know, considering how much the world has changed in the past 20 to 30 years, I mean, I could probably even say the past 10 years, but especially in the past 20 to 30 years, why would we think that it's a given that what we settled on in a vastly different time will still be just as appropriate and effective today? Friends, we cannot engage with the world the same way we did in the 80s and the 90s. 
We can't do it all the same ways. We, we can't do it the same now because the world has changed. Yes, God's message is the same, absolutely. God's expectations are the same, but how we go about those things sometimes are a little different. I think another thing, that, in, part in this, is that, is that it's up to our elders to give us a vision. I love these men. I know these men love God and they love this church, and man, I appreciate that. And we have a rich history of people that do that. You know, but along those lines, it's in part their job to, to give us a vision. Where are we going? What are we doing? And our end in this is to, to follow it, to support it, and be a part of it. And again, we can pray big. We give more. We do more. We set goals. And what does it look like when we get there? You know, here are just some things I've come up with. Along my own, you can take it or leave it. But, I mean, just think about these things. These are Brian Gregory things here. But what if, we, what if we looked around and we thought about, for example, the idea that our Sunday night attendance is typically lower for various reasons than Sunday morning? And what if on occasion, if we took the opportunity and we spent an additional 30 minutes on Sunday morning and we did something else on Sunday nights, like fellowship groups or something like that? We call it all-in-one Sundays minus the meals. Do you realize that if we had two more prayers, five more songs, Scott, could you leave five more songs? Okay, just follow with me. And we put 15 more minutes in Bible class. There's your extra 30 minutes right there. I know churches that have done some things like this, and in turn, their, their attendance overall has gone up. What if we learned new songs and worked on them regularly to keep our worship fresh and new? Now, how many of us can sing all verses of many songs without ever getting the book out or paying attention. Now, that's not a bad thing, but I will tell you this. I have caught myself time and time again tying my shoe, fiddling with my Bible or something else, and realizing, oh, we're singing a song. You know, because my point is this. If your mind isn't focused, your heart isn't going to be as focused either. What about this? And here's a big one. What if we were to work toward a new auditorium? How, thank you, Eddie. How many opportunities, just think about it, how many opportunities for fellowship and growth overall are we missing because we don't have a dedicated space? And let me tell you something. Nobody, nobody, except for maybe Grant, likes breaking down this auditorium. That boy, I've understood since he was really little, liked moving chairs, Okay? But let me tell you what, nobody else likes to do either. Set it back up. Next time it gets broke down and set back up, you watch, man. People scurry out of here like cockroaches. We're gone. Forget that. Nobody wants to set it back up. I've been a part of it several times, and it is not fun. But could you imagine, if you think about this, what we could do if we added on in the front of this building? I mean, we already had the plans. I mean, literally, shovel ready on the front of this building. The site work's already done. The building has been paid off for a while. And I know these are plans down the road. I didn't say we're doing this tomorrow, but I'm just thinking bigger here. I'm thinking outside the box. I'm looking at things. And my point is this. The major challenge in my mind for all of this is this, and for me too, individually and collectively. Will I stop thinking and acting in my personal life as if God can or won't? Boy, that's hard. That's so hard. And then, will we as a church stop thinking God can or won't? Because here's what I promise you. I promise you that God can, and I promise you that God will. Look at what Paul said in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Look, look at this carefully. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 that we need to ask, to seek, and to knock, and we'll find those answers, those things will be given to us. So, so here's the other thing about it, okay? When it's not what God wants, God will stop it. And when it's not what God wants, God will show us something else, or God will show us another way. So with all those things in mind, I'm supposed to extend an invitation here in the end of all of this. 
And so I, I, I throw all that out there because here's what, I, what I'm convinced of in the gospel is that the bar for Christianity is not so unattainably high that no one can get there, but it's not so low and watered down either that why would I even bother with it? That's not at all it. And what that looks like for all of us individually is a little different. Where the bar is set for me and how high I need to set it for myself may be different for you. It depends on where you are in your faith. But here's the awesome thing about it, though, that I'm convinced that we can do a whole lot in this church if we'll just allow ourselves to and we'll allow God to work among us here. So tonight, wherever you are in all of this, I don't know where the bar is for you. I don't know, I don't know what it looks like. But I do know this, that, that God is, is waiting right now to forgive us of anything we need to be forgiven of. And God's people always stand ready to embrace one another in the midst of our struggles and hurts. So if you find yourself subject to our invitation tonight in whatever way, I hope you'll come as we stand and sing together.